set up with a nice contrast between oh happy day and oh happy elderly moment. <laughs> it is a nice day. We welcome you this first day of October. October is uh, one of the more pleasant months to be in Oklahoma. And that uh, depends on your doctrinal interpretation, though, of the word pleasant. <laughs> Oklahoma Christian Lectures. Lectureship begins today. Uh, this evening there will be a period of worship and song. The um, Sunday sheet is correct in saying that the um, Northeast Church of Christ singers will be at 6 o'clock but not that it will begin, the whole thing begins at 6, I think it actually begins at 5.30. You might consult the website, the URL is given there uh, for the definitive details. Elder nomination process begins a week from today, October the 8th. This will be handled in a manner which is similar to what we did last year. Survey form will be mailed out to each member uh, Sunday morning by email. Printed forms will also be available. There will be a place for nominations, comments if desired, a place for your name which is necessary for the input to be counted. Nomination period will close two weeks later on Sunday, October 22nd. Those men in the higher end of nominations, the number of nominations will be contacted and those who decide to continue in the process will be interviewed by the Elder Nomination Committee. As last year, this committee will be led by John Cromling and the members will include five couples. We didn't necessarily plan it that way, they just had worked out. Brad and Leah Avey, Roger and Ruth Ann Dreyer, John and Lisa Dillon, Ryan and Abby Stevenson, Jared and Cassie Schism. It's nice to have a group, committee group, all of young people. And that depends on your perspective as well. <laughs> They'll be interviewing both husband and wife because as we've said before, both are important to the shepherding ministry. The target is to go through the process of nomination, interview, prayer, congressional input to ordination of the new elders by the first or second week in December. Relative uh, to the ease of the squeeze for parking places here around the building, uh, remember that there's uh, available parking um, at the shopping center and have a very nice uh, shuttle, the shuttle bus of blessing. And that, of course, depends on your doctrinal definition of the word shuttle. <laughs> remember, <laughs> remember in prayer, Cooper Spencer, Manima Stevens, Nancy McCurdy, who has a heart ablation procedure tomorrow at the heart hospital, and their daughter, Stacy, who also uh, will be having surgery. In that regard, John and Nancy McCurdy have been prayer warriors for this congregation for decades. And they have prayed together with many people in this assembly. John and Nancy are on the prayer team at the Springs, and they're scheduled to be in the coin and kneel room after services, back behind the kitchen, to pray with anyone who may have need. Some of us may want to drop by the room for prayer, but prayer for Nancy and John. Let's pray together. Lord, we ask that healing will be upon Cooper, and your peace will be upon the family, Brandon, Spencer, and uh, Ruth. We pray for Manima, who pray that all the cancer cells and these individuals will be removed by this treatment and that they will completely recover. Amen. Pray for Nancy's heart procedure to be done safely. It will correct the problem and she will rapidly recover. Pray for the process of the appointment of new elders for this congregation that we can all work together, that the springs can be in the will of God 
and be transformed into the fullness of Christ. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and worship together this morning. Continue praising his name. We come together asking God to raise up a new generation of Christ followers. Let's do that now. We bow our hearts. We bend our knees. Oh, Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. Oh, Lord, we cast down our idols. So give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Oh, God. Generation that seeks and seeks your face, oh God of Jacob. We bow our hearts, we bow our hearts, we bend our knees. Oh Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes. From evil things, oh Lord, we cast down our idols. So give us clean hands, give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands, oh God. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Oh God, let us be a generation that seeks and seeks your face. Oh God of Jacob. Oh God, let us be a generation that seeks and seeks your face. Oh.
to shame. Let them be ashamed who you are wantingly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love. For they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth, or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me. For your goodness sake, O Lord, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. 
that I have often felt unwelcome, unworthy, and unlovable. But I have also felt most welcome, worthy despite my failures, and deeply loved. I have felt confused, disconnected. I have felt abandoned. I have felt acute clarity, completely connected, adopted by a God and a community that loves me. I have felt numb, unmoved, nearly dead in my faith. And I have felt alive, unable to contain my joyful thanksgiving, so full of feeling that I cannot find words to express it. Can you relate? Please tell me somebody in this room identifies with this. Why do we keep coming to this table? This is where we come to remember who we are. We find our true identity and find the nourishment our souls so desperately need. This meal, the bread that reminds us that Jesus, God himself, let us break him so that we could be healed. The cup reminds us that Jesus' blood washes all of us clean so that we can be included in his kingdom. As we feast on this meal with him, we do it together, here in our small family and with the great big kingdom of God across the whole world. We proclaim that all are welcome. Just as Jesus reconciles us to God, we act out our salvation by being reconciled to one another. You do not need a reservation here. There are no seats of honor. Jesus is the only thing on the menu. And the only expense has been paid for by our generous host, God himself. Father, Son, Spirit. Philippians 2, 12, and 13, which follows our reading for the lesson today, tells us that Paul admonished Christians to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. The New Living Translation translates it this way. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Communion is one of the ways we do this. Because at this table, there is an abundance of encouragement and comfort, love and fellowship, deep affection and compassion in Jesus. Here we strive to be unified in mind, love for one another, and purposeful in a life that reflects our faith and proclaims the good news of Jesus. Know that you are most welcome at this table. You are deeply loved, adopted by God through Jesus and his kingdom. In this moment, we do more than remember what Jesus accomplished in the past. This feast is also a celebration of what he is doing right now, and it nourishes our souls. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we call you Lord because we long to give you control over our hearts, minds, and actions. You came to earth as a man, and even though you had the full power and authority of God, you chose humility and obedience, showing us how to live a life that counts, a life that elevates mercy and sacrifice over the dark selfishness of this world. We exalt you and bow before you, acknowledging that you are Lord. Father, work in us the desire for your will and to act in ways to fulfill your purpose. 
Amen. Come to the tables. God's own Son, precious. 
precious Lamb of God, Messiah, Holy One. Thank you, O my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. Jesus, my Redeemer, name above all names, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, hope for sinners slain. Sky, when my 
knees hit the ground, find me here at your feet again. Everything I am, reaching out I surrender, come sweep me up in your love again. And my soul will dance on the wings of forever, a flag falling Spirit soaring, I touch the sky when my knees hit the ground. I touch the sky when my knees hit the ground. Amen. Be seated, church. I want to welcome all who gather here in the name of Jesus Christ. We're in the middle of a sermon series entitled, You Are What You Love. And what Brett and I have talked about in this sermon series is that you are not so much what you think, although it's very important what you think, that you're primarily, you are what you love. That first and foremost, what guides our lives it's not just our thinking, but it's our desire. It's what we love. And we talked about how Christian practices of worship, they direct our loves. And that there are other practices that we participate in in the world that compete to shape our loves and guide our loves towards certain ends. In other words, You Are What You Love is a sermon series about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. To love what God loves. And that our actions will direct us to love what is a proper end, and that's God himself. So our sermon today is going to be very much related to you are what you love, but it's going to be somewhat of an interlude uh, to our sermon series. We have a guest uh, speaker or preacher today, Alden Bass and his wife Candace are here with us today, and their kids Dylan and Destiny and Desiree. They are new to this community. In fact, uh, Candace is the director of resident life at Oklahoma Christian. She's the new director of resident life. And Alden is a professor of theology and a colleague of mine at Oklahoma Christian. And what impresses me most, and the reason why I ask um, Alden to come and, and preach to us today, what impresses me most is that they are serious about discipleship. They move from St. Louis to a faraway foreign land called Oklahoma. <laughs> and it was a big deal for them to leave because not only did they leave a community and a family, they were a part of a community that intentionally lived together and prayed together. They worshiped together. And this may sound crazy to some of us, but if I'm correct, they had a practice of meeting, families meeting at 7 a.m., most days of the week, is that right? For prayer. They probably don't want me to say that. But as I've gotten to know them, their life reminds me of what we're talking about. They're practicing in a direction that shapes their loves towards their proper ends, and that's God. And so Alden is going to come preach to us this morning, and I hope you get a chance afterwards to meet them to welcome them, to welcome them as you would welcome Jesus. His text today is a lectionary text from Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 through 13. So we're going to read that together, and then Alden's going to come proclaim a word to us. But I ask as we finish, as is our practice when we preach from the lectionary, that as we finish, I'm going to finish with the word of the Lord, and I ask that you respond, thanks be to God. Philippians 2, beginning in verse 1 through 13. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, 
not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or to be taken advantage of. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. The six or so verses that follow that line constitute one of the most well-known passages in the New Testament, the one that just Ben just read for us. The next six verses there, sometimes called the Christ hymn, is a gloss on what Paul means by the mind of Christ. We hear of one who did not consider divinity something to be grasped, possessed, held on to. Of one who made himself nothing, literally emptied himself. Of one who was obedient to the point of death. And then we read that this same one was exalted to the highest place in the cosmos, the name above every name. When you read it, it seems like a pretty straightforward movement. Christ comes down from heaven to earth where he dies. Then he's raised up again and exalted to the heavens. Down and up. There and back again. Sometimes when I think of this, I imagine Christ up in heaven sort of staring down into the abyss of humanity and then taking off his robes of glory and peeling off his divine undergarments and preparing for the plunge into human experience. At some moment, after all this preparation, Jesus just dives in and he becomes one of us and he lives with us. But this image of Christ that I carry around with me, or at least this image of the moment of him coming to be with us, raises a lot of hard questions. What does it mean for God to lay aside divinity? What does it mean for God to stop being God in some way? Does God change? And if God changed, does he change back? Does he kind of go back and forth? Or is the second person of the Trinity, the Son, now somehow less than the first person of the Trinity? These are hard questions. One way that we grapple with them is that sometimes we speak as if Jesus were just something God did for 33 and a half years. That God shuttled down from heaven, that he assumed a fleshly body, and then he went about preaching, performing miracles until the crowd turned on him and crucified him. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he endured the pain of the cross, knowing Presumably that three days later, he'd be resurrected, exalted to the high point, good as new. God is God after all. Becoming human wouldn't have affected this. Jesus of Nazareth is the image of God on earth. I think the Christ hymn in Philippians 2 actually turns this way of thinking on its head. Jesus isn't just God for 33 years. And then back up to heaven, the big old white guy with the beard once again. 
As one theologian put it, God is Christ-like. And in Him is no unchristlikeness at all. God doesn't just become Jesus for a while. He doesn't just become human for a time. But Jesus is the eternal form of God played out within our limited human time and space. Which means that this self-emptying that Christ does is not a one-time plunge to be with us, but that this self-emptying tells us something about who God is and always has been from eternity. Take the covenant of the Old Testament, for instance. You all know what the covenant is, agreement between two parties. In the ancient world, it was usually an agreement between two kings. The rulers would hash out the terms of the covenant. Then they would conduct a ritual sacrifice in which both parties agreed to uphold their end of the bargain on pain of death. Now, kings have to make promises and treaties and alliances because they have limited resources and you have to negotiate in the real world. But the creator of the universe, whose powers are unlimited, maker of stars and sky, sea and land, the creator of the universe has no need to enter into agreements or to make promises to puny mortals. And yet over and over again in the Old Testament, This God binds himself to people, to humans, to Israel, through covenant. You see this in that strange and troubling story in Genesis 15. Maybe you remember it. It's one of those odd stories that gets passed over sometimes. Abraham is asked to cut open these animals and to lay them out side by side. You remember this. And he... He sits there and waits all day long for something to happen. He falls asleep, and whether he's still asleep or he wakes up, he sees this flaming flesh pot pass through the middle of these carcasses. And then God speaks to him and reaffirms the covenant. But what's going on with the flaming flesh pot and the carcasses that he has to shoo the vultures off of? Well, the flame is, of course, God. And what's God saying? He's saying exactly what those ancient kings said when they passed through the carcasses in the ritual of the covenant. God, the God of the heavens, is saying, if I don't keep the covenant, if I don't keep my end of the deal, kill me. I'm as good as dead. I'm worthless to you. This is what God says. Limits himself, empties himself, Binds himself to the creation. And in an even deeper and more mysterious level, God has to limit God's self to create the world. The infinite God, who's all and everywhere, has to pull himself back in order to make room for his creatures. The Jewish rabbis called this the tzimtzum, the contraction of God, where God makes himself smaller, where God makes within himself a space of nothingness, as Paul says, literally made himself nothing. And it's from that nothingness that he calls us forth. He makes a space so that we can be free, so that we can be other than God. And then in time, so that we can turn to God in love and desire. God's self-emptying in Christ was not a one-time event. It was not an action that God did. But God's making himself nothing, God's limiting himself, is who God is and always has been from eternity. Let this mind be in you, Paul says. The mind that was in Jesus Christ. This is the mind, the way of being, that we're called to. It's a way of being in which the self, our self, is limited, shrinks back, 
where we take our ego, which is always trying to fill up the room, and we learn to rein it in, contract. I mean, think about what you have to do to have a good conversation, right? You actually have to listen to the other person, not just wait till they're done so you can say that clever or funny thing that you have in mind. Think about what it takes to be in a relationship. You have to pull yourself back. Friends, mates, parents and kids, we have to learn to decenter ourselves to make room for the other person. This is part of growing up, right? This is part of maturing in love. Ironically, we have a hard time doing this when we're talking about God. Why don't you fix me? Thanks, Brad. You're willing to touch my bottom in public. Welcome to the Springs. <laughs> we have a hard time decentering ourselves when it comes to God, and I don't just mean this in the normal pious way. We speak as if God did all these things the creation, the covenant, the incarnation. We talk as if God just did it for me. Or for us, you know, we can talk about individualism, but that he did it for us. That God limits himself for us, but he's really not like that. He's really God. He's big and strong and powerful, but then he does this thing for me. He allows himself to be killed. He doesn't have to. That's not who he is, but he does it for us because we're special. We think God's chosen difficulty and suffering for us. He's become something that he's not. Like a rose trampled on the ground, you took the fall And thought of me above all. And then we think we have to be like God. And give up everything. And sacrifice ourselves. And be miserable like Jesus. In order to make this God happy. I think what Paul is communicating through the Christ hymn. Is that God isn't changing himself for us. He's not becoming something different for our sake. It's not that the incarnation is an act of heroic moral courage on the part of God. Look what this great thing that he's done. It's so hard. It's so difficult. But he did it for love. And this is what sacrifice means. The truth at the heart of the Christ hymn is this is just who God is. He's not doing something. God's just being God. In this series that you've been doing here on love, one of the deep truths is that we are being formed, shaped into certain kinds of people precisely so that we don't have to do and do and do all the time, which wears us out and exhausts us, but so that we can simply learn to be something. What we see in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection is the eternal love of Father and Son slowed down to our tempo, played out in human time. What we see is the Son giving Himself to the Father in love. And then in love, the Father returning the Son to Himself. Death And resurrection is the conversation between father and son, which has gone on from eternity. It's a conversation that's as old as God himself. It didn't do it for us. It did it because it's who he is. And so the Christ hymn challenges our own hymns sometimes. And when I think that God is son not sparing, send him to die, I scarce can take it in. Well, the writer's correct that he can scarcely take it in because it's a horrible thing to think that God sent his son to die. We use this language, perhaps without thinking too carefully about it, but it doesn't make any sense. And in fact, it makes God into a kind of moral monster that he sends a child to die. 
for us. Now, the Christ hymn initially seems to confirm this sort of language, that Jesus was obedient to the point of death. But what was he obeying? A command to die? Does that sound right? We have to think further. Perhaps the Father sent the Son to live. Perhaps the Father sent the Son on mission to show us how to love. That he came so that we might see what God looks like on the inside. Because what we've been seeing all along is our own distorted view of who God is. Jesus came to be among us so that we could see this giving and receiving of divine love, which is the Trinity. He came to show us these things because what we needed most was to understand what it means to be human again. We spent so long trying to be gods ourselves. Our sin, though, is precisely in trying to be God and failing to be human. Our sin is in our failure to give ourselves fully to one another. Our sin is our fear of being rejected. Our sin is that we can't trust each other because we've all in some way or other betrayed each other. And of course, all of us have in turn been betrayed before And it's hard to love, and it's hard to give ourselves, and it's hard to be intimate with each other. Simply put, our sin is that we failed to live out that divine love in whose image we were created. It all goes back to Eve doubting God's goodness in the garden. It all goes back to Adam throwing her under the bus when God comes around. What we need to save us is a fresh start, a new Adam, which is exactly how Paul talks about Jesus, the new Adam. He's the one who got it right, not got God being right. He's the one that got humans right. Jesus is the one who's able to live out his life fully trusting the Father, completely aware of this divine love, Jesus is the one who lived a life without fear of betrayal, which is why he could be betrayed. He lived a life without suspicion. And he was willing to give himself up to others completely, even if it killed him. And it did. God did not send his son to die. God sent him to live, and we killed him. Killing him was our plan, not God's. We killed him because we could not trust that this love was real. Because we were suspicious of anyone who was so open. Anyone who was so free of the kind of paranoia, of the kind of insecurity. That's all we know about being human. We could not believe his message. And we could not accept this good news of forgiveness. Like Leah said, we just couldn't feel it. I'm not worthy of this. I can't take it. We couldn't empty ourselves of our own doubts and fears and we nailed the stranger to the tree. Jesus didn't, God didn't send his son to die. He sent his son to love and to live and we killed him. One theologian has said that there are two paradoxical truths which express the tragedy of the human condition. The first is that if you do not love, you will not be alive. The second is that if you do love, you'll be killed. We cannot live without love, and yet we are afraid of the destructive, creative power of love. We need and deeply want to be loved and to love. And you know, when that happens, it seems like a threat because we're asked to give ourselves up to abandon ourselves. So when we meet love, we kill it. Jesus was the first human being who had no fear of love at all. The first to have no fear of being human. Jesus had no fear of being human because he saw his humanity simply as a gift from him whom he called the Father. 
You might say that as he lived and gradually explored into himself, asking not just the question, who do men say that I am, but who do I say that I am, he found nothing but the Father's love as the answer. This is what gave the meaning to all of his life, the love which is the ultimate basis and meaning of the universe. However, Jesus might have put it himself, and we have no idea what he thought about all this. He saw himself as simply an expression of the love which is the Father, and in which the Father delights. His whole life and death was a response in love and obedience to the gift of being human, an act of gratitude and appreciation of the gift of being human. Jesus didn't empty himself for us. It's just who he is. Jesus didn't come to die, but he did die. Because that's what divine looks like when it's played out in a fallen world. Jesus came to show us what it means to be human again. This was the mission that the Father gave him. And this is our mission today. If there's any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Jesus, you have won me. You have broken every chain with love and mercy. Triumphed over death and you are worthy of glory and praise. Jesus, you have won me, you've broken every chain with love and mercy, you've triumphed over death and you. Shout it out, church. Shout it out and lift up one voice. In worship, sing it out until all the earth can hear it. Jesus is alive and He saves. He rescues and saves. Let's announce the gospel. to will and to work for God's purposes. Let the same mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. Be filled with the same love and look to the interest of others. With reverence for God, work out your own salvation. And may God quench your thirst for love and consolation. May Christ Jesus strengthen you and encourage you. And may the Holy Spirit lead you on and make your joy complete. Church, go in peace to love and serve the Lord this week. Amen.
is.